1943, about three million people died in the Bengal famine. At the time, India was a colonial possession of the United Kingdom, and Sir Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister. So when the Viceroy of India sent a telegram to Churchill, begging for vital food and medicine supplies, Churchill laughed. He ordered that those supplies be diverted to already well-fed troops in Europe and Yugoslavia. And then he sent a telegram back, joking that if it were true that famine was so widespread, why hadn't Gandhi died yet? That example of callousness and brutality and racism has pretty good company in Churchill's personal history. This was the man who considered the wrong done to the people he called the Red Indians of America to be the what he termed a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race to have come in and taken their spot. This was the man who thought the Jewish people were incorrigible aliens and suggested that they invited persecution on themselves by only having loyalty for their own race. This was the man who considered himself in favour of using chemical gas to kill what he called uncivilised tribes in the Middle East. Today, we call them the Afghans and the Kurds. This was the man who ordered soldiers to fire on striking miners in Tony Pandy. This was the man who ordered the Black and Tans to kill people on the streets of Dublin. This man is arguably considered to be the greatest liberal hero of the 20th century. A 2002 poll named him the greatest Briton of all time, above Charles Darwin, William Shakespeare, Isaac Newton, John Lennon, Alan Turing, Stephen Hawking, and Emmeline Pankhurst. He beat King Arthur by 50 places, he beat, which is genuinely astonishing. He beat Bono by about 86, which probably isn't that astonishing. <laughs> He won the Nobel Prize for Literature and was nominated for the Prize for Peace. George W. Bush kept a bust of him outside his office to remind him to fight fascism. His funeral was the largest that has ever been held in the world. He is universally reified as a champion of tolerance and peace and democracy. I had a simple question at this point. Why do we revere this maniac? Shakespeare never committed a crime against humanity, and Bono certainly didn't, with the possible exception of the album Songs of Innocence. <laughs> the reason we glorify Winston Churchill is because you can't glorify abstract ideas. You can't build a statue of struggle against fascism, but you can build a statue of the personification of struggle against fascism when you build a statue of Churchill. You can't build a statue of democracy. What you can do is deliberately fail to imagine people like Churchill with complexity and nuance. What you can do is use the barest and most sour-faced strictures to interpret the person he was as a person upon whom those values can be imprinted. What you can do is selectively remember his achievements to construct a hero that is worth remembering. Is that such a bad thing? We do it all the time. Thomas Jefferson raped his slave, Sally Hemings, and fathered several of her children and denied them, all whilst giving speeches explaining exactly why a white man marrying a black woman would produce, in his words, a degradation to which no lover of his country, no lover of excellence in the human character could innocently consent to his children. J. Edgar Hoover is well remembered for leading the FBI through eight successive presidential administrations. He also sent a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King demanding that Dr. King kill himself in the bizarrely specific time frame of 34 days. That's not to say that the respect we have for these people should be immediately substituted for hatred and disgust. It's to acknowledge that we rarely remember heroes as human beings with pretensions and indiscretions and pride. But is that such a bad thing? Maybe it's important that the causes that are worth remembering have champions and faces to put those causes to, regardless of the imperfections of the people whom we choose. That's at least what I was willing to accept until I went to Berlin a few weeks ago. A disturbingly large proportion of Berlin city centre is devoted almost exclusively to memorials of, to the various groups of people whom the German state attempted to wipe from the face of the earth. 
The first and most obvious is the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. It consists of about five acres of concrete blocks arranged in a sloping grid. You can walk through them like they're a disconcertingly well-organized forest, but some of them are at odd angles, in which I'm told is an attempt to make you a little bit afraid that they're going to fall on top of you, which is an attempt that works. A little further is the memorial to homosexuals persecuted under Nazism. It's a large concrete cuboid. You can peer through a small hole and see a video of two men kissing. On the side of a long road is the memorial to the Sinti and Roma victims of National Socialism. It's a very small and still concrete pond, and in the middle you'll see a triangle, which is what Roma people were forced to wear in the concentration camps in lieu of the Star of David. A, a fresh flower is placed on it every day. There's a memorial to the 70,000 people who died in attempts at forced euthanasia, and there are two columns that memorialize Polish soldiers and anti-German resistance fighters who tried to resist the Third Reich and died doing so. Something struck me at the end of all of that. It was powerful and incontrovertibly lasting. It was that when you consider the brutality and cruelty with which these people died, the best memorials don't seem like enough. That's why I don't care whether it's productive to, socially productive to ignore Winston Churchill's failures. I don't care if it creates narratives of struggle against fascism that are abstracted and don't give us human heroes to aspire to be. Because brushing the failures of our heroes under the rug is disgraceful when it means brushing along with them the memories and stories of their victims. If the creation of slightly more compelling narratives of struggle against fascism requires someone like Winston Churchill to be our hero, I don't think it's worth it. In the 1940s, around 11 million people died at the hands of the German state. Their deaths were vile and tragic and unhappy. Their deaths were useless and senseless and dreadful. Their deaths were compelled on a scale unprecedented and unmatched in human history. Their deaths don't deserve to be remembered just because it's convenient for us to believe that their killers were evil. Their deaths deserve to be remembered just like three million Bengalese who died on Winston Churchill's orders aren't. Just like the Kurdish villagers who died choking on their own blood on Winston Churchill's orders aren't. Just like the miners who died on strike in Tony Pandy on Winston Churchill's orders aren't. Those who died in the Holocaust deserve every statue and every fountain that we can build them and so, so much more. But they don't deserve to be remembered because the people who killed them weren't the ones who got to write history. They should be remembered because they were human beings and for no other reason. Thank you.